Creativity, episode 102, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, with Mr. V, starting in five, four, three. Thanks, Biff. Hey, it's Vince, otherwise known as V. Welcome to another episode of Creativity. Today, we're going to be talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which is now streaming on Disney+. Plus. Marvel show, head writer is Malcolm Spellman. Also, the series was created by Malcolm, produced by Marvel Studios, and director of all six episodes is Carrie Scoglin. If I didn't pronounce that correctly, my apologies. Starring Anthony Mackie, Sebastian Stan, and Wyatt Russell, the cap everyone loves to hate. That just means he did a great job. So my love for Captain America goes back to... Me being a little kid, I've always liked Captain America and Bucky thing. And, of course, I grew up on those um, very static 1960s uh, cartoons. You know, most of it was still frame and the action was limited. But it still made your imagination go. And the artwork was just fucking incredible. So I've always been a huge Captain America fan. So... uh, you know, from uh, even the, the 1990 uh, Captain America movie, which uh, you can get now, but you couldn't get for a while. Th- that is um, pretty bad, but it's still good in a bad way. But um, updating it, you know, uh, Marvel has done an incredible job with all, pretty much all their storytelling. Uh, some people said, you know, a couple of these series, they're not really happy with, or blah, 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 and, you know, well, that's because your asses are fucking spoiled, and this isn't two hours, this is a longer format, it's different, then we have this thing called COVID-19 hit, and things had to be rearranged, readjusted, scrapped all together in some cases, um, you know, if you have something like that, and you can't, have, let's say you have a scene, and you need 200, you know, background extras you have you may have 12 foreground people in this scene let's say you're in a control room and there's a a crowd outside the window well you can't do that now well how are we going to do that well now we can cut to news footage of some type of protest somewhere with you know three people sitting in an office each at their desk single shot single shot single shot edit 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 and you have to do the same thing for less because you can only have so many people in a room due to the restrictions at the time and people say, well, that's bad writing. Well, no, you have to figure it out. I mean, they have all this money on the line. Um, people are subscribing. They're paying. They're waiting for this content. And, uh, you know, even in a, a world that was kind of screwed up, hey, they did complete it. You know, they did a bunch of series. And they're, still, and they're putting out content. Not too many people do that. A lot of movies are on hold. A lot of people losing money. Like, for instance, the James Bond movie. I think for every month it doesn't come out, it's gaining. It ha- that movie company has to pay $1 million of interest on the loans on that movie. So they want the movies out. But they don't want to release a $300 million movie if only 12 people can go in a the theater because then your box office is going to be considerably lower and then it's going to be looked at as a failure, even if it was at 100% capacity at 12 people. What are you going to do? So anyway, back to Captain America and the world that we are now faced with. Falcon and the Winter Soldier, who will get the shield? Well, we already know Falcon's going to get the shield. He already had the shield. He gave it away, and then they gave it to the putts, played, you know, brilliantly by Wyatt Russell. Everyone says, you know, a lot of people are pissed off about that character, and they should be, because he did a great job. You know, good for you, dude. Way to be remembered. And, you know, um, it's interesting because what he brought to it was that whole background of growing up in celebrity culture. He knows what all that is. His parents are huge major icons. Kurt Russell, come on. You know. Anyway, his sister's a famous actress, so he's been around it. He knows what it is. He knows what it isn't. And uh, his interviews have been pretty good. He's a likable guy. And, uh, 
he just did a great job playing a smarmy dickhead who happened to take the shield and uh, uh, dirty it up in the worst way possible because the last thing you'd want to see that shield do uh, is what he did with it. Anyway, so we're going to start at episode one, the setup. New World Order. All right, so I'm just going to head right to the Wikipedia page and read off some of the uh, information that's on here. Okay, so the premise. Of course, this is again taken by from Wikipedia. Six months after being handled a mantle of Captain America at the end of Avengers Endgame in 2019, Sam Wilson teams up with Bucky Barnes in a worldwide adventure that tests their abilities and their patience. It also challenges uh, what an icon can do, what it can mean on the high end and the low end. But Okay, so episode one is a new, or, uh, new world order. Six months after half of all life returned from the blip, Sam Wilson stops George Batrock and the terrorist group LAF, who has hijacked a plane and taken a hostage over to Tunisia. Tunisia. Wow, need more coffee. With support from the U.S. Air Force First Lieutenant Joaquin Torres. Now, Mr. Torres will figure into the larger picture down the line. Uh, if you don't know in the comic books, uh, Mr. Torres winds up taking up the mantle of the Falcon. And uh, the actor was really, uh, really likable. He had a good uh, repertoire. With uh, Sam, they got along great. Uh, I think, you know, we should see him sooner rather than later, probably in the next thing. But we'll discuss that later in the podcast. So Wilson, who was given the mantle of Captain America by Steve Rogers, struggles with the idea and decides to give Rogers' shield to the U.S. government for a museum display. Of course, trusting the U.S. government, guess what they do with it? (laughs) They didn't put it in the museum. Bucky Barnes, who was recently pardoned, attends government-mandated therapy, where he discusses his attempts to make amends for his time as a brainwashed assassin known as the Winter Soldier. Torres investigates another terrorist group, the Flag Smashers, also from the comics, who believe life was better during the blip. Torres is injured by a member of the group with superhuman strength, and he witnesses them rob a bank in Switzerland. He later informs Wilson of this, who's been attempting to hold his reluctant sister Sarah with the family fishing business in Delacroix, Louisiana. The government soon announces a new Captain America, John Walker. And boy, does that piss off Bucky Barnes. He's not happy that uh, Sam relinquished the shield. He's got a major issue with it, as he should. But Sam also has a reason why he relinquished it. And had good reason, as he should. Anyway, now we go to episode two, The Star-Spangled Man. Okay, this episode is written by Michael Castellin. Walker appears on Good Morning America and reveals his desire to live up to Roger's mantle. Barnes tells Wilson that he should have kept the the shield before accompanying him to Munich, where the Flag Smashers and their leader, Carly Morgenthau, are stealing a shipment of medicine. Wilson and Barnes attack the group of the terrorists are all super soldiers and overpower the pair. Walker and Lamar Hoskins arrive to help the Flag Smashers escape. Walker wants to work with Barnes and Wilson, but they refuse. He kind of takes it personally. Traveling to Baltimore, Barnes introduces Wilson to Isaiah Bradley. I loved that they brought Isaiah Bradley into this. So fucking cool. Isaiah Bradley, a veteran super soldier who fought in the Winter Soldier, who fought the Winter Soldier in the Korean War. However, Bradley refuses to help them uncover information about additional super soldiers due to being imprisoned and experimented on by the U.S. government in Hydra for 30 years. Barnes is arrested for missing a therapy appointment, but Walker has him released. Barnes and Wilson again refuse to work with Walker, and Barnes suggests to Wilson that they envisit that they visit the imprisoned Helmet Zemo. Now, Isaiah Bradley. You know, 
I've watched a bunch of podcasts. I've watched a bunch of YouTube videos. And people are saying, oh, oh, dude, this is like totally woke. Oh, dude, this is like the woke. Dude, shut up. Can't you just celebrate and enjoy what you're watching? People are like, oh, the writing's there. My God, let it breathe. Give it a... Okay. My son, my youngest son, he's going to be 21. When he was three, he was introduced to Captain America because that's one of the books that I read all the time. And guess who my son's first exposure to Captain America was? It was to Isaiah Bradley. And it was a badass story. Great storytelling. It's, I think, one of the best Captain America stories, aside from Winter Soldier, which is another, you know, Brubaker did with that. is just another incredible story. But Isaiah Bradley, you know, they matched it up with the experiments done, you know, and uh, it's just amazing. And people are like, oh, that's what you shouldn't have, blah, blah. I'm like, no, it's not. When you tell the truth and you're talking about history, here's the thing about history, you know, you can reflect it in your storytelling because people recognize it and it resonates. That's why you need history. If you don't have history and you get rid of everything, what's there to resonate? Where's the meaning? You need the meaning. We're telling stories. You're watching stories. This isn't real life, but they're incorporating real life elements into it. And comics have always done that. So is sci-fi and fiction. People are coming to the world like, this is some new thing. No. We've been cool for a long time over here, so I don't understand. But, oh my God, the Isaiah Bradley storyline in this is amazing. And I'm hoping they either do a uh, series with Isaiah so we could follow his story. Or they do a, uh, a film. And they could do a couple adventures. You know, maybe he gets to work with, um, you know, they could bring in Wolverine and him. And, you know, I don't know if Cap knew of him or not at the time, before, after, later. Don't know. Anyway. On to episode three. Written by Derek Coslan. Oh, sorry, Colstad. Power Broker. Zemo offers to help the Flag Smashers, so Barnes orchestrates a prison riot to help him escape prison. They travel to Madripoor, a criminal sanctuary city island run by the mysterious Power Broker. A high-ranking criminal, Selby reveals that the Power Broker hired former Hydra scientist Dr. Wilfred Nagel to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. Now, Selby is killed when Wilson's identity is exposed, and every bounder hunter in Madripoor targets Wilson, Barnes, and Zemo. Sharon Carter, of all people, who has been living a fugitive on the island, saves the trio and directs them to Nagel's lab. They learn that he had created 20 doses of the serum, which Morgenthau stole. stole bleh. The bounty hunters attack them, and Zemo kills Nagel in the chaos before finding a getaway vehicle. A classy one, I might add. A convertible. Carter stays behind, and Wilson promises to get her pardoned. Now, Peggy Carter, Peggy Carter, Sharon Carter has a really cool fight scene in here. She kicks a major ass. I've always enjoyed her character, but I've never really trusted her because right from the get-go, she was a liar. So we'll see what that means. Anyway, the bounty, at the bounty hunters attack them and Zemo kills Nagel in the chaos before finding a getaway vehicle. Carter stays behind and Wilson promises to get her pardoned. The flag smashes Ray the bomb. The Flag Smashers raid and bomb a global Reparation Council storage facility in Lithuania while Zemo, Barnes, and Wilson search for them in Latvia. Barnes is confronted by Ao, a member of Wakanda's Dora Milaje. <sighs> Ao, I want to marry you. What uh, When she comes on screen... The world stopped. Holy shit, does she have a really incredible presence on camera. Amazing. 
And of course, we'll talk more about the Dora Milaje as we move down, but that is one badass group of ladies, I gotta say. And they kick some major, major ass. Okay, so before we go much further, this is going to be full of spoilers because we are discussing the first season and this isn't a speculation video of season one. This is talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier season one. So if you don't want it spoiled, come back after you watch the show or if you don't mind being spoiled and you want to hear a conversation about it and stick around. And of course, don't forget to Ring the notification bell, hit like and subscribe, Vaudeville Press, and the people here at Creativity, thank you dearly. Come back, come back often. Tell your friends, tell your family. Anyway, back to Winter Soldier. So, oh, where did you go? Hit the wrong tab. Okay, episode four. Oh. Episode 4, The Whole World is Watching, written by Derek Kolstad. Again. Ayo. She is so striking on, on screen, it's amazing. You know she's going to beat your ass if you even look at her even slightly cross-eyed. And I kind of dig that. Anyway, Ayo gives Barnes eight hours to use Zemo before the Wakandans will come and take him, as Zemo killed their king, T'Chaka. Zemo helps find Morgenthau at the funeral for her adoptive mother, where Walker and Hoskin, Hoskins intercept them. Now, the Hoskins character, who is Cap's new quote-unquote Bucky, I didn't care for the way they, they wrote his character. He felt um, underused and overused in one instance. Um, I think they, he should have, uh, they should have given him more to do. They did introduce you and your family later on, but we'll talk about that as we go. Anyway, so Wilson speaks to Morgenthau alone and attempts to persuade her to end the violence, but an impatient walker intervenes, of course, and a fight ensues. Now, the walker character, also right from the get-go, you know he's suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, something that affects a lot of people uh, in civilian life, but uh, people who served in the military and who have been in theater and even out of theater, depending on what their job was, um, can be affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's a very important issue to bring attention to, and I was happy that they did. Uh, my brother, as a veteran, suffered from PTSD and depression, and last year took his life. So with them... Um, following this storyline, um, it gave me even more reason to dig the whole thing because they were letting people know this is how it works. Everyone's heard of what PTSD, 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 but no one really has ever tried to explain it publicly or seen it in the correct way. You know, you can see him actually struggling and I uh, commend him uh, for that part. And, you know, he's not the only one struggling from PTSD. The whole world is, which is probably something we can relate to. When you have a mass trauma across society, people are going to uh, have mental health issues and... Uh, there's a lot of that going on with Bucky Barnes. You know, therapies, they normalize therapy, which is really cool. More people should do it. You know, um, even Morgenthau <clears throat> suffering from PTSD. The kids are suffering from PTSD. Everyone except, well, Zemo maybe just hides it better. 
than everyone else. I could be wrong. Anyway, so Zemo destroys most of the serum with his heel with a really cool shot underneath of something uh, we used to do in commercials a lot with basketball players and uh, hockey players and stuff like that. Uh, so you see underneath as I'm like peeking through the floor of the ice. Uh, so Zemo destroys the serum before being apprehended by Walker, who secretly takes the last vial as it conveniently rolled over to this little part of a stand, and he, of course, put it in his pocket, and you knew he was going to do something with it. You knew he wasn't going to destroy it. Brick. And, like I said, that's just him doing a great job of being an actor and portraying that character. So Ao and, D and the Dora Milaje come for Zemo, but Walker refuses to hand him over. In the ensuing fight, the Dora Milaje humiliate Walker while Zemo escapes. They don't humiliate. They beat his ass. Yeah, humiliation. Uh, that's letting it off easy. So Morgenthau threatens Sarah, forcing Wilson to meet her to attempt to persuade him to join her. Walker and Hoskins engage other members of the Flag Smashers, leading to another fight in which Morgenthau accidentally kills Hoskins. Snapped his neck like a rag doll. That kind of pissed me off because he was done and out, dead and snapped, by episode four. The actor playing him did a great job. But they could have, I, I don't know, I would have liked to have seen more from him. Maybe they can bring him back in some weird way, and uh, he can uh, either, I don't know, I just think that was such a waste. You know, they tried to make him look like a cheap knockoff of Bucky, but, you know, the dude had character, and he was great at what he did, and uh, I don't know, I just wish they gave him more. Anyway, what are you going to do? But, oh man, when the Dora Milaje came in and that fight scene... That fight scene, I'd have to say, is one of the best fight scenes in television ever. They just... Pfft, there's so much going on in that fight scene. And the precision in which they did it, the acrobatic um, proficiency is just amazing. Anyway, <clears throat> getting back to it. Okay, where were we here? Okay, so Morgenthau threatens Sarah, forcing Wilson to meet her to attempt to persuade him to join her. Walken and Hoskins engage other members of the Flag Smashers, leading to another fight in which Morgenthau accidentally kills Hoskins, like we said. Enraged by his friend's death and having taken the serum now, Walker uses the shield to kill one of the Flag Smashers in front of the horrified bystanders who film his actions on their phone, it goes worldwide, and the whole world sees the shield of Captain America taking the life of someone who actually idolized Steve Rogers. Now the shot with the blood dripping off the shield at the end as the episode came to a close. That's pretty iconic. But how dare you do that to Cap Shield? Sam should have kept it, buddy. Should have kept it. Okay. On episode five called Truth, directed by Dallin Musan. If I mispronounce your name again, I apologize. I get it. People do that with mine constantly. Here we go. Wilson and Barnes demand the shield from Walker. And here's the thing. Well, I was telling my son, like, at the end of episode four, when... They confront him. There is, when they walk in and he, they're all in the warehouse, there is no fucking way that dude is walking out of that fucking building with the shield. They have to take it from him. He's undeserving. And uh, to them, it's the biggest insult to both of their best friends that they could ever imagine. And they will not. Let that stand. So Wilson and Barnes demand the shield from Walker, leading to a fight in which Walker destroys Wilson's wingsuit. Wilson and Barnes take the shield, breaking Walker's arm. 
Barnes finds Zemo and Sokovia and hands him over to the Dora Milaje, while Walker receives an other than honorable discharge and is stripped of his title as Captain America. Duly. Duly. Noted. Afterward, Walker is approached by Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine. Who, by the way, that is just great casting. When she came on the screen, I about shit my pants. That's awesome. I, I love her. Seinfeld, 11 years, amazing. So anyway, Wilson leaves the damaged wing with Torres. And he said, basically, you can keep it. And he goes back to visit Bradley, who states his belief that a black man cannot and should not be Captain America. Wilson returns home and helps fix the family boat with the assistance of several locals in Barnes, who delivers a briefcase from the Wakandans to Wilson. Now, in the previous episode, when he first ran into Ao, he asked for a favor at the end of the episode. Obviously, that must be what's in the case. But, uh, yeah, th- going back again to the previous episode again, I apologize. Ao, while fighting Barnes, and they're not fighting to kill each other, just they're just fighting to wait, you know, waste time, basically. She does this thing, this little judo move. Pew, 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 pew. Boom. His fucking arm falls off. And everyone's like, what? Including Buck. His reaction is the best. Apparently he didn't know that uh, you could uh, do a couple of beepity bops. And uh, his arm would fall to the floor. I'm sure that's going to work into the story later on when he probably disconnects his own arm to save someone or... That's how he goes out. That's just my prediction. But, you know. So Wilson leaves the damaged wingsuit with Torres and visits Bradley, like I said. Wilson returns home to fix the family boat. Already did that. Okay, Barnes and Wilson train with the shield to agree to move on from their past and work together. The Flag Smashers plan an attack on a GRC conference in New York City and are joined by Batrock, who Carter has secretly hired. In the mid-credits scene, Walker builds a new shield from scrap metal and his war medals. Now, you know, when there was... I wish they would have shown that shield a little bit more, the homemade one, like they used a hero, a hero hero shield, and that's the one that's on camera. They made it look more like the old one, where I think it should have been more rudimentary, more like uh, the first Iron Man suit that uh, Robert Downey wore in the first movie. I think it should have echoed that, since they were already echoing that scene as he was hammering and building the shield. I just think that just would have made more sense. But what do I know? I just watch and consume all this stuff and love it. People complain. Dude, I'm 52 years old. I've been waiting for this shit my whole fucking life. And if people want to complain about it, hey, that's great. That ain't going to happen here. I mean, you may disagree with things. That's fine. You know, but uh, I think some are getting a little bit too uh, overly aggressive on their disagreements. Because when it comes down to it, fans are fans. We love the content. We love the characters. We love the stories. Everything else shouldn't matter. But sometimes it does. Okay. Episode 6. Written by Malcolm Spellman and Joseph Sawyer. One world, one people. Wearing a new Captain America uniform and flight suit from the Wakandans, Wilson flies to New York to stop the Flag Smasher's attack with the help of Barnes, Carter, and Walker. Now... Sam's suit looks so good. It is, pro- I think it's one of the best suits that they've ever done. Uh, and w- what he does with his wings, and the just, I mean, the opening scene, episode one, where he's flying, he's, he's in a, a dogfight, basically, flying through the canyons. Amazing. And his other, you know, his other fight scenes where he's utilizing his jetpack 
and his wings. Um, there's just some new type of action that we get to enjoy, and I'm really digging that, especially that one shot when they came up to came up to him and he just dug in with his wings. Pew, pew. We didn't know he could do that. Holy shit, was that cool. You know, that's why we watch this stuff, man. We're geeks, and we love being geeks. Anyway, Carter accidentally reveals that she is the power broker to Batrock and kills him while Wilson attempts to reason with Morgenthau before Carter kills her as well. Actually, she did not reveal that. I think this is, uh, maybe I didn't hear or see it correctly. Now, someone had told her that she was the power broker, and she was talking to someone above her, so she could have let him think that she was the power broker because she was going to fucking whack the dude anyway. So it doesn't matter. Now, did she kill him because he hit the nail on the head that she is the power broker? Or, since he was going to get whacked anyway, did she just make him believe that? I think it's the later. Anyway, so Wilson convinces the GRC to postpone the forced relocation of displaced people that Morgenthau died fighting for and instead makes effort for them to help them. The remaining serum and hands flag smashers are caught by Barnes and Walker and sent to the raft. You know, that prison that's floating out in the middle of the ocean, which they should probably do a whole movie about that. Uh, we got to see it, you know, in Civil War and stuff. But anyway, there's some cool storylines that have happened on that thing in the comics. But they are killed by Zemo's butler and route, which was badass. Because a lot of people are like, who the fuck is this old dude? He presses a button. <laughs> And they blow up. Uh, it turns out that Zemo is still in control. From a jail cell. Floating in the middle of the ocean. And had his 80-year-old butler. The butler did it. That was pretty funny. Nice little joke there, too. So Defontaine gives Walker a new uniform and codename U.S. Agent. Suit looks badass. Same as the other one. Just black. They even made a joke about it. It's the same suit. I like when they de when they uh, make fun of themselves and they uh, self deprecation is always is always a a good thing when you enjoy comedy. So Barnes makes amends with everyone he hurt or, or enabled as a Winter Soldier, while Wilson has a memorial dedicated to Bradley Isaiah Bradley added to the Captain America Museum exhibit. Now, if you didn't cry during that scene. You have no heart. That was amazing. Great, great acting. Um, yeah. Isaiah Bradley is just, that's such a cool storyline. His grandson will probably want, I think he's, I think his grandson was the Patriot or something, or the, something like that. Um, I don't, I don't remember offhand, but eventually, uh, his grandson will wind up wearing the red, white, and blue. Okay, here. So Barnes makes amends with everyone, like I said. In the mid credit scene, after receiving a full pardon, Carter rejoins the CIA and intends to use this access to sell the government secrets and resources. Now, that doesn't mean she's the power broker she was talking to someone. I think she's an agent for the power broker, working for the blah 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 blah, blah you know, layer, layer, layer. Now, there's some interesting theories on who the power broker can be. I have a few of them. As I'm hoping it's Dr. Doom. You know, some people say it's going to be uh, 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 Thunderbolt Ross. Some people think it's... Some people think it's Norman Osborn, which is another good one, but that would tie into Spidey now. Supposedly... They asked if Spidey could be in Winter Soldier from what I've seen poking around uh, in articles and a couple of videos on there, but doesn't mean it's true. Power Broker. I mean, who do we have out there? Who do we have out there that's a tech guy? Could it be Hammer? Could it be Mr. Fantastic himself? Could it be Mr. Sinister? 
Maybe it's Doc Ock. Hmm. Who could the power broker be? Anyway, rumor has it we were going to get to see the Thunderbolts. I just think that was a misdirection. And uh, they, now, power broker could also be Kingpin. Because that, even though they're not the same character in the comic books, doesn't mean that they follow that rule in the movies and the uh, television universe, which is now all the MCU. I think they're doing a great job. I really do. I'm really enjoying it. Now people are just getting spoiled uh, on the level. You know, they're like, oh, my God, how come this wasn't like that? Dude, did you have fun watching it? You know, did you sit there with your arms crossed, pissed off, waiting to be disappointed? Or did you sit there with a smile, have a nice drink in your hand, soda, coffee, alcoholic beverage if you're of age? And did you just relax and enjoy the story being presented? Because that's how I take everything. I'm glad that they're doing this content. I've been waiting for this, like I said, since I was a little kid. Anything that happens, I take it for what it is. The Arrowverse, I cannot watch anymore. Why? That time has passed. I like the Arrowverse for what it was, for the budget that they had, and the constraints. We still got a lot of superhero content, some cool stuff in the Arrowverse. Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now that crosses against all the DC properties and changed everything across the board. Now, we have the next step of the evolution of the superhero presentation. You know, we have the Titans. We've got um, Doom Patrol. You know, the, I'm, of course, I'm not talking Marvel. I'm just talking about presentation as comic book. You know, budgets are getting higher. we got Green Lantern coming out. Uh, Wanda and Vision, which is another video or another podcast I'll do. I really like that, but you had to read the comic books in order to enjoy it. There also was some things in there that could have gone better, but I'll let you know on that episode. But, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., even that was kind of hokey compared to looking at Winter Soldier or Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which will probably now be Captain America and White Wolf as we go into Season 2, which I'm really looking forward to. I'm hoping they do Season 2. And then the third is a Cap and Bucky movie with Sam and uh, Barnes. That's my hope. Now, rumor says that Chris Evans is coming back as Hydra Cap. Will he or won't he? No, he's going to be in the What If series, which is the animated, and everyone's kinda, everyone kind of came back and did voiceovers for that, and the animation looks fucking phenomenal. Um, so I hope we get, actually, we wind up getting feature-length features with that type of animation because it is expensive, but it looks, it looks great. Um, will they put Hydra Cap in there? Will we have a cap from an alternate universe now that everything is multiverse? Um, you know, on DC and Marvel, everyone's going that way anyway. Um, sorry if I confused you guys with the whole introduction of DC bullshit into there. Not bullshit, but the whole... Anyway, multiverse, and someone's texting me. Uh, the multiverse, you can do anything. I mean, you can bring back Cap and Iron Man. They could play each other characters. Iron Man could be Doctor Strange. Steve Rogers could be the Human Torch. I mean, he's played both. So, we don't know. And that's what's so cool is now they're getting into these quote-unquote Elseworld stories, um, alternate takes, and people are open to it and they explore it. Now, what I'm hoping is that the Avengers get stuck somehow in some kind of weird time warp. They wind up in the 1960s and we get Silver Age Avengers um, and they kind of battle it out with you know, the first family of Marvel, the Fantastic Four. That's what I would like to see. But I'll save that for another one as well. Captain America, great. Uh, I, I really love I really love this show. Um, 
I would give it, I would give the show an, like an 8 out of 10. If I had 8 out of 10 cups of coffee is what I would uh, rate this show at. Now, there were some issues here and there, but you're going to have issues with everything. Most people who sit and, you know, and uh, go on YouTube or whatever, you know, some a lot of them are young, and there's nothing wrong with being young. But a lot of people don't understand what it takes to get something produced. Yeah, you, you know, understand what it takes to do a podcast or a YouTube video, but you don't understand the, so sometimes years maybe even decades for some people, how long it takes to get your idea to the screen and all the bullshit between A and Z. It is the most fucked up thing, but if you make films, you totally understand, and only a filmmaker would do that. You have to be an artist, and you have to be compelled. Otherwise, no one in their right mind would try to make a fucking movie, ever. Because it's a pain in the ass. But we love all those people who had pains in the asses who entertained us for the past 110 years. And hopefully we'll do for more. Since most of the stuff's going to be going to television anyway, I don't see theaters really making a comeback. Um, not that there won't be films in theaters. I think it'll be more of a uh, um, higher-end type of a thing. You know, couches and drinks and dinner, that type of stuff. Sure, there's going to be regular theaters and cinemas, and I hope, you know, I hope as many can stay open as possible. But I think they're not going to get back, you know, what they lost. The people who are diehard movie people will still go back, but I think the casual viewers, they're only going to go for, you know, specific things, not just, hey, let's go see a movie, it's Friday. No, you know, they may wait for a specific project to go see, and then they'll go see that. But I don't think, you know, most of the people have home theaters anyway, so they can experience that way. You know, they're the generation that's coming up now is not the generation of what I grew up in or the ones previous. To me, there's something about sitting in a movie theater eating popcorn, and having people not talk while you watch the movie. And you can get totally engrossed, lost. It's like you're not even there. You're a fly on the wall watching this reality unfold in front of you. But that's what creativity is. Anyway, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Come back again. Next episode, I think we're going to do... Um, for All Mankind Season 2. Enjoy the day. May your coffee always be fresh and your couch always be comfortable. I'm V, and thanks for listening to Creativity. See you next time. One more thing before you go. I'd like to do a public service announcement. You give me a few seconds. Okay, we're going to talk about... A lot of veterans out there have a hard time dealing with PTSD, depression, suicidal thoughts. I want to let you know there's a place called the Veterans Crisis Line. Phone number is 1-800-273-8255. Press 1 to speak to someone. Are you a veteran in crisis or concerned about one that is? Connect with the Veterans Crisis Line to reach caring, qualified responders of the Department of Veterans Affairs, many of them veterans themselves. How do you connect with the responder? Call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1. Or text 838-255. You can also chat online. And there is support for the deaf and hard of hearing. This is free support. It's confidential. It's available every day, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week and serves all veterans, all service members, National Guard and Reserve, their family and friends. Remember, find support near you. It's only a phone call away. If you need help, it's out there. Again, call the Veterans Crisis Line at 1-800-273-8255. And thank you for serving.